Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. In 1942, in the cold desert of a small border town of Texas, a group of kind are kidnapped and mass embraced by members of the fanatical sect, the Sabbat. Out of this group, only a handful survived, and through rituals and mentorship, they became the pack known as the Pale Riders. Representing the Sword of Cain, they are wielded by a mentor to cut deep wounds within the heartland of Mexico to the enemies of the Sabbat. Wars on Fire is a vampire the masquerade Sabbat chronicle that follows the Pale Riders pack that consists of Mitch, a Lazombra played by Adam, Coyote, a Ravenous anti tribute played by Alex, Eldrick, a Katif played by David, Jasper, a Bruja anti tribute played by Joaquin, Cora, a Shimizi played by Slavic, and Richard, a Venture anti tribute played by Tillman. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM or on Facebook at Twin Cities by Night. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Wars on Fire, Vampire the Masquerade Wars on Fire, which is a Sabbat game. Uh, For those of you who have not checked out the character creation session, you go back and watch where we went over the characters and kind of the background if you have any questions. So the year is 1942. It's uh, late April of 1942. We come in upon a town called Cedar Creek, which is a small Texas town that has seen their sons be shipped off overseas to fight in the Second Great War. The town slowly has been losing its fight against uh, the bigger town, the bigger cities that reside around it, where citizens have moved towards them for work due to the industrial nature of the Second World War. But in this town is uh, a former vacation resort. The 20s during the swinging years was kind of a place where people would go to escape the, their jobs and, and what was required uh, around them. We come upon this town where this resort lays in the middle of the town. And you see uh, t- tumbleweeds come across, and it's kind of a dry April where the, the coldness of the desert is starting to depart and starting to be taken over a little bit by the warm spring nights that Texas is known for along the borders. Cedar Creek. Announced to why, announced why their citizens find themselves at night being very weary out and about like they did before the Second Great War. Mainly it might be because of the Pale Rider pack that resides within this, this former holiday retreat. Pale Riders are a young pack, only been embraced for about a year and have been spending most of their time getting to know the backgrounds of their blood, of, of their sect a bond that's uh, grown unbreakable between them. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start where each character is going to talk about kind of what they do when they wake up. And I'm going to start first with Coyote. What What's Coyote's evening like when he wakes up? Like, how does he usually start his evening? Uh, he gets up, he goes outside, and he smokes a big fat cigar, stares out at the desert night air, and he thinks about, what kind of, you know, how he can make a bit of money tonight and uh, where he can find a good feeding ground. He's a, he's a, he's not a complex person. Coyote is a very territorial person, right? He finds this, 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 this haven for your pact to kind of be almost sacred. and doesn't like when people not uninvited encroach upon it, right? Absolutely. He'll, he doesn't, he's, he's not really an ask questions kind of guy. If there's someone snooping around and, well, you know, even a door-to-door salesman turns up after sunset. I don't know. That probably doesn't happen. But, you know, you get the picture. If someone turns up and uh, they shouldn't be there, they're going to either get out of there quickly or not be heard of again. Nice. And what, describe again, for those of you who may not watch the first session, what he looks like. Uh, he's a big, burly, long-haired, slightly unwashed Mexican dude. He's... More, he's rather scary looking. Yeah, he's about like six foot six, six foot seven, because you took the, the the huge perk, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, he's he's a very big person. Uh, I guess the closest parallel would be someone like the Undertaker, maybe, but not undead and not wearing a ridiculous costume. But he's you know he's a giant dude with long scraggly hair and a lot of muscles and tattoos. Nice, nice. All right, Eldrick, let's go go ahead and tell us about what happens when he usually awakes. 
And t- describe what he looks like a little bit in his mannerisms too. He's um he's an elderly man. He's sixty eight years old. However, he looks older than he is due to the cancer. So even though he's sixty eight, he's been aged quite a bit by his ailment. So he looks like he's in his late seventies. He's a uh, five foot eleven, white hair, very very uh, venerable. Um, when he awakens, he he automatically is back to the point where he was when he was embraced, which is being eaten alive by cancer. So when he awakens, it's it's in a pain uh, that you know is piercing down to the the marrow of his bone, and um, so obviously he's a, a crotchety individual i mean if you wake up every morning and you're you're dying from cancer you're you're not going to be a a pleasant person to be around he carries a walking stick because he doesn't always um repair those injuries it depends on you know how much food is available whether or not he's going to repair himself and he's mentally hardened to the point where he's been living with this pain for so long that you know, sometimes he just deals with it and sometimes he doesn't. Um, gotcha. He's very, very invested in uh, his businesses in Texas, which are being managed by his nephew at this point in time. So when he awakens each night, he goes to his study where he sits down, listens to the, the news of the, the war, and reads a newspaper for for all of the current events, which – He's taken great amount of interest in. Nice, and uh, also coyotes or ravenos attribute, and uh, Eldrick is a Katif. By the way, all you guys have your max blood pool for your generation. Just take one off for waking up. You guys can track that. Dave, your characters. Uh, are you healing your four levels of damage, or are you just going to keep it for now? I'm just going to keep it for now. Tracking. Thank you. All right. Next, we move on to Jasper. Jasper, tell us a little bit about uh, your character and about what he does when he usually awakens. So, first thing Jasper does when he wakes up is he gets up, puts on his glasses, looks in the mirror, and goes, This, you are going to change the America for the best. And a smile. And then, all right, let's get out to it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Go, all right, go ahead. So, yeah, he's probably, he's like a five foot eleven, black hair, Blue eyes, glasses, sort of a sort of a thinner man, but he and and uh, he was already good looking before, and now with his uh, in, after his embrace, he just got that was like that dangerous, like, almost intangible edge to him. Just makes people just like, hey, like a predatory <laughs> edge almost. Yes, almost exactly. Yes, and so he after uh, checking on the news after but after Eldris is done with it, of course, then he. Uh, Turn, like, heads to the study and just like, okay, so what can I? Let's go over the notes and see if I can make a what speech. Can I? What can I do today? How can I? How can, what can I? How can I enlighten people today? Very nice. Jasper's a Bruja Antropy, which is going to be really interesting with his concept and presence. I, I can't wait to see. And also, I think he of all everyone, he's had the highest cumulative like Valdry rolls for people rolling for him. So he's. He's very well re- liked in the pack, I guess. I don't know if likes the proper term. All right, let's go on to Caroline. Go ahead. Tell us about your character and tell us about what she does when she awakens. Well, Cora was embraced also when she was like, I don't know, 70 or so. And I'm, I'm not sure she even knows when she was born. She, she grew up on a farm, you know, had a couple kids. Two of her kids died. Her husband was abusive. At, after her embrace, after she was embraced into Clan Zimitsi, it was sort of a new beginning because, you know, she could give herself her old, her lost youth back. And so, you know, now she looks about mid 50s. She was working on her appearance a lot in her in the past year or so. And so the first thing she does after she wakes up is probably clean the earth out of her hair because, you know, Zimitsi, that soil keeps them <laughs> fresh. And... <laughs> keeps them young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so probably the first thing she's going to do is 
take a look in the mirror and, you know, take a look at the wrinkles and stuff like that. I think the things she wants to fix, basically, wants to change. So, like, almost like she has a new sense of worth now, like, after, like, a, yeah, uh, a new lease on life, for lack of a better term. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, she is Shimizu, and also the packed priest. Pact priestess. Next, we're going to go to Mitchell the Ductus. Tell us a little bit about your character and what he does when he awakens. All right, Mitch is in his late 60s. He's weathered, but still stands tall. Uh, his hair is scraggly, mostly white. He always has an angry scowl. Um, he dresses very plainly, you know, basic pair of pants, basic button down shirt, nothing fancy, well-worn boots, practically worn right through the soles. First thing he does after waking up in the evening is he'll crack open his Bible, read a few passages, say a mother or sorry, say a Hail Mary, and then contemplate what he's going to do to sort of work his way into his new existence. All right. And uh, he is La Zombra, by the way. So for the last year, uh, you guys actually got to know the individual who spoke to you guys along the Rio Grande. That was the river where that where that had happened. And his name was Vidar. He was, uh, you found out this last year, an archbishop in the Sabbat. And he, he's the one who kind of took you guys in a way under his wing. Once you guys as a group decided that this was your best haven here in Cedar Creek, he started not only himself coming here to give you lessons, but eventually sending those of the sect uh, to teach you different aspects that you guys need to know. For example, clan knowledge or, or you know, just so you got have general knowledge now of what it is to be a, a canite in the, in the Sabbat. Mitch, you're sitting in your room doing your Hail Marys, contemplating that, you know, you have that crucifix that you have on the wall, I take it, that you, you kind of kneel and, you, and you, you pray towards. And as you're looking up at the, the cross and it's kind of, you know, the, 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 the low candlelight that you have in your room or the maybe the new electric, electric light that has kind of been in there that you have turned on that's dimmed, you notice the shadows that are along the wall seem to re recede from it, like the, an ocean wave going back into the ocean. And, and as you kind of notice the difference, you turn around, you look, and you see Vidar standing there behind you. He's like six foot three, and uh, this time he's actually wearing like long kind of white angelic robes, and he's just simply looking down. You, you still find it unnerving sometimes when he looks upon you because while you still find yourself at times blinking or, or maybe a twitching or, or something, he at times seems almost made of stone or, or, or something that is elemental more than mortal or immortal. Uh, he he sits, stands there and just simply is staring at you for like two minutes. He has very pale skin, oh, these old uh, Nordic tattoos that are done with almost like ink that looks green in a little way. But you, as you look at him, you can see a little bit to where you swear that they, they, they move. But it's not like a constant movement, but it's almost like if you look away and look back at him, one may be an inch, you know, further back towards his neck or along his face. He has very piercing blue eyes that, that are almost to, to match uh, the whiteness of his eyes. And his blonde hair, which is short and cut almost more in a, a European proper manner at the time than one of his, his, his ethnicity, is, almost has this gleam. Uh, that is alien in nature, like 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 that seems to be conditioned to the to its fullest capacity. Almost looks like it's carved like his skin in a way. And he sit, and as he stand there for like, and you're used to this. He'll simply just stand there and kind of look at you. On but you don't ever get the sense of like he's trying to do it in a threatening way. It's just how he is. He looks down upon you. He says, "I need you to gather your pack outside." Of course, Bishop. And then as you like look at him, he just kind of steps back and you see him kind of like just slowly like be looks like he's sinking but also falling back into the shadows and then he's gone um i will mitch will stand right. up he'll put his bible back onto his bed grab his rosary wrap it around his wrist and he will begin working his way through the communal haven to gather the rest of the pack knocking on doors or i'm already outside so okay so he'll yeah. eventually have to make his way outside communicate with whatever in whatever order you want to you know right. how long has it been since we've had to do something like this 
he's came and tied you before. I would say himself, probably like three or four months, but he's had representatives of him come probably like on a, a, a twice a month, uh, you know, at times just to kind of, they'll spend a couple evenings with you guys and maybe not even like talk to a couple of you, but talk to another, two, you know what I mean? Another two, but I'd say it about two weeks, but with him, it's been about three or four months. Okay. And I'll let you, Mitchell, go ahead and you can, you can talk to each of them on whatever order you wish. Mitch will go to uh, Coraline first. Hey, we got shit to do. Wake up. You're, you're not waking me up just for shits and giggles, are you? No. We've been visited. We have shit we need to do. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, get the dirt out of your hair. Get yourself all <laughs> gussied up and get your ass upstairs. I'm going. I'm going. All right. And from there, he'll make his way over to Jasper. Knock on the door. Jasper, we're yes. meeting upstairs. Yes, of course, dear brother, of course. See you there shortly. <laughs> and he'll go past Coyote's room and be a little annoyed that it's empty. <laughs> and then he'll go over to Eldritch's room. Knock on the door. Eldritch, we've uh, had a visitor. We need to get upstairs. Is there never a moment of peace in this place? No, no, there is not. Take Auntie Delivian aren't going to wait for you to s- sleep here. I'm not sleeping. I'm taking care of business, old woman. <laughs> care what well, that, tone you take with me, you hag. That business is going to have to wait. We have uh, shit to take care of. Once Mitch ma- wakes his, or makes his way up to the ground floor, not having found Coyote, he'll eventually look outside and see the cherry from the cigar. Be yeah. Like, Pick him a taste of the dagger. Doesn't need to breathe, and he still wastes time on that shit. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, kids, let's go. Out the doors. And with that, Mitch will walk outside. Walk right up to Coyote. Put that goddamn thing out. Don't you know how easy that is to see at night? I'll stare at you for a second. Kind of ticking over in my brain, and then I'll just put it on the ground and stomp it out. Thank you. Indoors, at least. Hmm. So as, as you guys are standing there uh, talking amongst each other and you come out, you, you turn and you look and you see like 20 feet away when you didn't even like hear anyone come and you see Vidar st- on his knees. When I say he's on his knees, his, his posture is perfectly like at a 90 degree angle, meaning he's not like sitting back on his haunches on his knees, slouched over. He's like on his knees and he's like straight forward straight up, and he's looking almost like at a 45-degree angle at the stars. You can kind of see, and at this moment, you've kind of known what, what dealing with him. You learn, like, even when you, like, the first month or two when you were working with him and he had these moments, you guys would try to say something to him, and you just kind of learned it's not worth it. He's ready to speak. But behind him, uh, you see a figure that looks to be, like, Native American in a way. He has like t- tight blue jeans on that were that were you know that the usually people who worked on cattle farms wore for like the last 70 years he has a pair of cowboy boots on underneath him with a shirt you know like a button up plaid shirt that he has tucked in he has strong on his hips two six shooters you see that he has rounds that are in like the, the little leather the little leather belt that he has around that holds him and he has a shotgun that he has uh slinged on his side but he kind of he has a strap on it, but he kind of like holds the strap. And you learn that you wherever you see Vidar, you always see him. He has a stone cold look to him, and he you guys have no learned that he is a Cherokee before he was embraced. Elanipi, that's his name. He usually doesn't speak that often. Not that he's like in the military or in the the Native American style of the guy. He has spoke to you guys on your own, but whenever Vidar is around, he just just knows his spot. He always seems to be vigilant and hyper alert whenever he's around Vidar. You know that he has a position of what's called a paladin, where he basically his whole purpose is to, is to protect Vidar. But you get this weird sense that like Vidar probably doesn't need him. You know what I mean? But he just gives Elenipi a, a, a sense of purpose. And and through talking through to the paladin too, you guys have also learned that the paladin has a love for you guys that also Vidar has for you. Vidar has multiple times told him that he that he loves you guys. He doesn't say it with any shame. 
And so the paladin also shares that same view as you guys. He doesn't look at you guys like any kind of threat to his status or anything to that extent. But he sees Vidar, who has taken a mentorship to you guys, and he feels that it is also his duty to, to have that same kind of love to you. So as he's sitting there on his knees, he's looking off into the air, and then he kind of like slowly like looks back, and you see like his eyes almost like a like you see when the clouds go over a moon that like you see like a black kind of like a, a murkiness go over his eyes a little bit, then it's, then it's back to the pale blue eyes, and he he slowly looks at each of you, and he kind of beckons for you guys to have a seat in one form or another, and you know you guys know and you have to do, you know either take a knee or sit or you know what I mean like in a kind of a circle in front of him there, any kind of motions to you guys to do that. I'll sit nearest the uh, Native American dude is my right. guy's pretends that he's cultured. And he kind of nods to you, you know, in an OP nods to you, like in a, in a sign of respect in a way. Yeah, I'll give him one back. I'll back. I'll stop picking my teeth with a knife too and put the knife away. Does everyone else sit down or what do you all, the rest of you do? Yes, Jasper sits down and it'll be, and just sits quietly. I'll Mitch sit down get, next to the ductus. Mitch will get down on his knees first, and then he'll sit on his feet with his legs folded underneath him. He's going to begrudgingly oh, put himself good. down in a in a painful manner with his cane. You guys are tight, so you understand what's going on with Eldrick there, but it's definitely different than you guys feel when you wake up in the morning, definitely. Vidar looks at all of you slowly, and then he, you see him smile. He's like, I'm very happy grown within this last year and, I, and I've told you plenty of times that a total freedom is total annihilation I know that some of you feel that you don't want to have anyone give you any kind of direction and I understand that and you have been taught by many that is often a core tenant of our belief system us who are destined to have to do things for our sex and that is why I've chose you guys because you like rest of those from that evening showed uh, an amount of maturity and of discretion that 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 uh, some lacked at that time, but now your time of schooling is over. That you that you have absorbed so much of what we have taught you. Uh, I, have, I have nothing but good things to say from our staff that I speak. But as obviously as some of you are aware, in in the the great motor lives that you lived, that oftentimes with training like this, there's always an end point to it. And, and then we have come to that time where now we need to utilize you for why we that, – that, that comes and you kind of see him look and he kind of looks up at the stars again for a second. And there's like this 30-second pause and he's like looking at the stars. And it's almost like you guys – it's almost like when you talk to an old person, no pun intended to you guys, but that like – you're like – he's sitting there waiting and he's looking at the stars and he kind of looks back at you and he's like, uh, unleash you upon the, this world. Put you together because I believe that you guys have discretion – and you have, like I said, the maturity that, that is hard to find in canites. What I need you to do is I need you soon to travel. Are you aware of the town that is called Juarez that is on the border of the United States and Mexico? We are. Within that town of that town of Juarez, there is a creature of our kind that for centuries I have been looking for. And I've gotten word that he is in this city and that it needs to be destroyed. I, I'm taking back the pronoun of he, and I'm using the pronoun of it. Excuse me, I apologize. That it needs to be destroyed. In your teachings, you've been taught of a clan of our kind, of Canaanites that have not come under our umbrella, called the Fathers of Set. Have you not? Mm-hmm. Hey, he looks at all you guys. I'll just grunt. So, that clan has been in this country, in this land, for a long time. They, they they go they go by another name here other than the followers of Seth. They go by a, a, a name called the Talik. They are Aztecians, and he and he looks towards uh, you, Coyote. Mm-hmm. They, they are of your blood, and they for the long time ruled this land here as gods, where they received sacrifices uh, of massive amounts until our clan, that uh, you Mitchell and our sect made their foothold here in the New World, while many. The anti-Diluvian slaves, and you seem to get a little heated, foolishly tried to hold on to their kingdoms in Europe. But the resistance that we met here and came from that group, the Talik, the, the fathers of Set, a bloodline that is long forgotten to them. Me, my first pack, we were tasked to wipe them out, and we did for the most part, but a handful of them escaped. 
and they still survive by making deals with the slaves of the antediluvians or even worse deals that I want you to hunt down this one that I think that we can find. I want you to wet your swords on there and I want you to absorb its strength and you to make the pact and the cause stronger. Do you have it in you or am I wrong in thinking that you're already? We will do this, Your Excellency. Whatever it takes to the slaves of the antediluvians. Whatever it takes this to make, even that, make our stru- cause stronger, we will do it, Your Excellency. Thank you. And he's, this is worse than a slave of the antediluvians and almost. This is one who thinks he's a god and thinks he makes deals with gods. And that's what I want you to look into. And he kind of, you see him, he goes and he gets off his knees and he sits, he sits back, like in kind of like in an in a Indian style on the ground. And he's like, the El Paso and what is, they're, 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 they're interesting in their makeup when it comes to who has control of them. El Paso right now is a strongly held city that, that is in the clutches of the Camarilla. We, but we are not worrying about them right now because they are a force that we do not want to reckon with. They have thousands of mortal soldiers for their great war that they're fighting in Europe right now. We do not want to awaken that dragon. But down south below them, not even a couple miles away, resides Juarez, where they turn their nose to activities that go on there, and they don't have control of that area. And it's an area that is controlled by Anox, ones who have yet to see the error of their ways and join our cause. Since of a, of the a clan, the clan Giovanni there, but not the Giovanni that you've been talked about, that you've been told about, not the ones who had the strength to go against their anti-Diluvian and destroy them, but a, a, a family of theirs that they have brought into the ranks of their clan that, that has called the Peace and Obs. And they have one named Marcus, Marcos, who is there, that he controls half the city of El Paso too. And he is the one who says he has the information on where, uh, this, this Setite, this Tlacul, his name is Itzili, stays at. I want you to go speak to this Marcos and see what he needs. Do what you feel is must. I trust your judgment. If you need to pry the information from him, fine. If you need to make a deal, fine. But I want him to destroy. I want that Setite. I want that false god. I want him destroyed. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yes, Your Excellency. We do, Your Excellency. We have a pact of ours, a that, that is currently hiding in El Paso. We've always had a presence there that we've kept unknown. They call themselves the banditos. You can find <laughs> them if you need to. And he knows, Ilanipi knows how to find them and he motions back to Ilanipi. He's going to go with you, but he's not going to be involved. He's simply going to observe on my behalf, but he's not going to get in your way because this is a test. Do you understand? Yes, master. Indeed. Understood, Excellency. And... One final thing. Do not poke the dragon in El Paso. Do you understand me? We do not want to awaken that dragon right now. We do not even need that land right now. I do not want to start a war. Do you understand? Yes, avoid the Camarilla. For now. If they get in my way, I can't promise what will happen, but I'll try and, I'll try and avoid trouble. We will be discreet. Yes, understood. All right, then. And he gets up and he looks. And he's like, I will go now. I'll let you speak to Linidi. And he turns around and he, as he kind of walks off again, you see him walk into the shadow. You see the white robe and eventually it gets absorbed. You see, as you look, you see like it, uh, the palette and the me be like looking at him, like with a sense of like love and caring. But you would know, you, you know, though, that they're, you know, that, that the archbishop would never like blood bound him. You know what I mean? To force that adoration that he gets from you can't his blood bound But that is his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. So, <laughs> so he turns around, he looks, and he's like, he sits back down with you, and he looks, and he looks over at the group, and he looks at you, Mitchell, and he says, you will find me, you'll find me on the edge of this town, and he gives you a random, like, ranch address. There's a small ranch there. That's where I'll reside. You can come to me and find me there if you need anything. Do you understand? Understood. All right. He's like, I wish you luck, my brothers and sisters. He's like, you are a powerful weapon. I fear, I fear for those slaves of those, of those monsters that, that uh, I just fear for our enemies. But I, I don't feel bad for them at all. He gets up and he turns around. He wipes the dust off his jeans. And he goes up and you kind of like are always off taken. Or excuse me, you're always off put by the fact that this guy rides, still rides horses, you know. And you see like 100 yards away, there's like a beautiful stallion that's kind of like tied 
to a tree, a thinner tree that's there, and he walks towards it, and he gets on there, and he rides off. Just so you know, by the way, El Paso is like about an hour away, two hours away from where you guys are at. So, all right, scenes on you guys. If you got questions out of character, tell me. Well, yeah, so you're, you guys are tasked to speak to a guy named Marcos Pisanob, P-I-S-A-N-O-B. What the Pisanobs are, are their Pisanobs are a South American family of necromancers that were embraced into the Giovanni. And they're like the Giovanni's presence in South America, okay? And what he's saying is that this guy ha- says he has uh, information on uh, Tilaku, which is a bloodline of the uh, of the Sedites. That's spelled T L A C I Q U E. That uh, were worshipped, uh, but were wiped out when the Inquisition came uh, by Sabat. Uh, the Sabat tried to work with them at first, out of character, because they liked their blood rituals. But then they realized they needed to wipe them out to get control of South America. So they went through and started wiping them out. That Talaku's name is I T Z L I, Itzli. Yeah, War is is controlled by Anarchs. And the Pisanobs, Giovanni's. And war is the Anarchs control the drinking in the bar side of things because of the prohibition. Because when, when alcohol was prohibition happened, people went to war is to go to the bars with all this stuff to drink. So the Anarchs, they, they're making money from that. They're controlling that. The, the Pisanobs, the South American Giovanni's also control in war as the seedier stuff that happens, like the missing people. Or like stuff that maybe Americans go there to do that's taboo in America. And they kind of like fill your desire kind of way. Across the Rio Grande River in the United States, El Paso is controlled by the Camarilla. So, Seems on you guys. How many cars do we have? How many do you how many, need? How many horses do we have? Yeah, exactly. Horses? Horses don't need refueling. They do. They, it's called feeding. Yeah, but they do it on their own. You don't have to buy anything most of the time. I'd bow to your wisdom, sister. We could take a car. We could take a bunch of horses. In this day and age, it's probably going to be a lot easier for us to take a car, as much as I am loath to acknowledge that. I'm sure we could all fit into my uh, my roles. All right. I ain't got a doozin. And he's going to mo- motion to to um, Jasper to help him up. Oh yeah, yes, yes, brother, yes. I'll help you out. And he'll he'll take his rolled up newspaper to to knock the dirt off his eight hundred dollars suit. Cool. Mister just roll his eyes and grumble as he gets up. God so damn, that damn shoes. <laughs> All right. So we want to make our way to Juarez. They don't need anything before we leave. And we should probably get our crap. I'm yeah. guessing we have weapons stockpiled. Yeah, I, I I give that to you guys. Yeah, all right. Yeah. How, um, how many weapons Eldridge are we talking? Has a couple of pairs of um, what were those Luger's? I think he had Luger's. Yeah, I believe so. Eldridge has a couple oh, of Luger's it- and um, a couple of Tommy guns that he keeps for his own amusement. I take it you guys have I, I, a full array of weapons that fits each of your personality okay. quirks to the max, dude. 1903 Springfield with its <laughs> bayonet. One other thing, too. Uh, also, he gave you um, he gave you a, a, a name of the of a, a, a hole in the wall that uh, in Spanish is the Black Rooster. Uh, but that's where he says that you can find a representative of Marcos is that to set up a meeting with him and everything. So. Do we want to meet with the paladin first, or do we want to meet at the Black Rooster first? I don't want to show up to the paladin empty-handed. Let's go to the rooster first. All right. Follow your, follow your guide, brother. All right. So you guys are taking off? Yes. All right. As you guys get in this role, who's driving, by the way? It's not going to be me. I don't I'll drive. drive. I'm driven. No, I'll, I'll, drive. I'll drive. I'll be the youngest. I can... I, oh, you want to drive? A little less suspicious when, not, when the young person's driving. Oh, it's going to be a tight fit for five people to fit into my Rolls Royce. Hey, I'm young too, man. Come Coyote on. Coyote can ride on the back. He, he can just All hold right. on to the back. I'll sit I in the back with them. A couple of kilos of you. Me and right. Caroline. So the, who's uh, driving? Ja- okay, I'm Jasper's gonna... driving. Yeah. Granny Caroline can sit on my lap because I've got a soft spot for her. <laughs> Aww. All right. Cool. There you, All right. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I'll brush you here while All we're right. driving. Maybe we need two cars. I think you're the only one who would have. I can afford two cars. It's not like. All right. You can have like a pickup truck. Yeah. 
Yeah, we can we, up... we can let Manuel and and um, I guess Mitchell whippersnapper. Yeah. So you're taking a Rolls Royce and a pickup truck. I take it Mitchell's driving the pickup truck. Who's anyone riding yeah. with Mitchell in the pickup truck? Yeah, I'm in the back. I'm in the okay. Oh, the nice. Yeah, you're right. sitting in the, the bed of the truck. All right. And then the Rolls Royce, Jasper's driving in Coraline. And I would take it that Eldrick is sitting in the in the, in the the front with, next to Jasper. Or is he sitting in the back? No, I sit in the back. With a oh. cane just propped up. Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be yeah. looking tap, tap through my roof. newspaper. Flipping through my newspaper. All right, cool. Casually. So you, you guys are burning down a desert road. This is actually a weird sense of euphoria that you guys are feeling right now because you've gone out to Cedar Creek and you've done your mayhem and havoc in a way to learn what it truly is to be a canine. But this is almost like you're the you're the you're the ground you're the you're the hound in the race and that and the gate was just lifted and that rabbit's going and that's the road and you guys are just chasing after it right now hoping to catch what's at the end. It's almost like a sense of feeling, but also like invigorating for some of you, especially probably you, Mitch, driving that truck. Like you feel young again, like you're in World War One, like you're that young guy who just didn't give a shit. And, you know, Cora, you're feeling like a young woman who's getting to live the life that she never got to live before, you know, almost like a lady having a midlife crisis. She's like feeling young again and, and vibrant. I'm pretty sure Eldrick is like just reading his paper and, 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 and doing what he does, but it's almost like you feel free in a way. And all that talk about that you were taught by different people about the Sabbat meaning freedom and that you've really, you know what I mean? Kind of even had that inkling of what this, this is what it is. You burn these miles for about an hour and a half and then you start slowly coming up and it's like a Saturday evening and you come up to where the one, the bridges are to where you can cross the Rio Grande. At this time, you know, this is really before border security was really what we know it to be as nowadays. So most of the time you just had to drive over, just wave, show a hand, and you made your way through because Juarez wanted you to come there and Texas wanted you to go there. So you do all the shit that they didn't want to have done in El Paso in the United States over there. And they wanted you to come over there because they wanted your nice American green dollars that were that was making their city booming at the moment. As you guys get to the, to, I would take it, which car is going first, Mitchell or uh, uh, Jasper? It's going to be the, the truck. <clears throat> the truck can go first. All right. All right. The truck, you roll up to where, like, you know, there's lines of trucks coming through. And you notice at this time, too, like the border security, they're not young, vibrant males because guess where all young, vibrant males are right now? They're overseas right now fighting in the war. So you kind of have these old, you know, people that, with you guys before you're embraced, you know, World War One vets or even older that are just kind of sitting there to collect a paycheck who uh, aren't really, uh, you know what I mean, being too, really too caring at all about what's coming through. As you drive up, Mitch, you see this guy with the droopy mustache kind of over his lips that hang over both of his lips, neatly cut hair, but it's gray. And he kind of just looks at you and he has like this khaki outfit on, you know, khaki pants, khaki top, has like a pistol on his side. And he's just sitting in a, this plastic chair. He doesn't even want to sit inside the booth that he's supposed to sit in. And he's just kind of going like this with his fingers. And he kind of catches eyes with you, Mitch, as you drive by. And he kind of nods, you know, hey, you understand. I understand you. Have fun kind of thing. Like, he's not going to give you shit. Like, you guys have, due to your age, that there's some kind of bond there. And he just kind of motions through. And you, you see Jasper, you drive up, and he kind of looks at you for a second, then he just, like, motions you through. He wants to pretend like he gives a shit, but he really doesn't, and then you just kind of, like, whatever, get on through. And you guys are now coming into Juarez. The, the, you know, as you come across Juarez, it's almost like an overwhelming sense of being in a swarm of people. Because you came from Cedar Creek, where it's really small. You're left to being taught to just, like, humanity being all around you. And this is almost like a, a, a this is almost like a a, a, a a statement in the fact that you are now officially different than all this that is around you. You see people walking along the street. Some are dressed. A couple are dressed in zoot suits. You see some wearing like bib overalls. Other wearing jeans. You see old ladies kind of trying to make their way. You see like Americans walking through the crowd, shoving through like you know with having like homemade beer in their hands, like beer bottles. Even though prohibition has passed, people are still coming here for a good time because it's cheaper than the States. It's now looked at down upon as in like more of the Bible 
Texas at where they live. And, you know, people are, cars are trying to make through, but people are crossing the street, almost like interjecting themselves between the cars. And like, you get a lot of like touching the hoods, like, hey, chill out as they try to like go across the street and make their way. You see some soldiers in their uniform coming across there looking like they may be on leave from the training that they're doing. You see people selling fruit and wares and flowers, even a couple of you. And this elder probably annoys the shit out of you as you're sitting there trying to read your paper. You're tapping on the window and you see a guy with like flowers and kind of pointing. You see that, Cora, as that happens. And you see a couple of the, uh, of the Mexicans look at you, Coyote, as you are in the back mm. of this truck, this big old guy. And you see them kind of just giving you a look like, what the fuck are you? doing man as they walk by and you see and you see a lot of like lights of signs just you're like god damn how many fucking bars or how many like little markets are here or whatever and it's just along the streets and as you especially you coyote as you look because you have a better angle than everyone else you're like this place is almost like a you've, you 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 kind of heard about wars you know you're not exactly from wars but this is like a metropolitan place in a way almost with how full of people what what, what are you doing mitch I'm going to just slowly cruise and try to see through all this bright glaring bullshit to see if I can find <laughs> the bar we're supposed to be looking for. As you're making your way towards uh, the the bar, eventually, like after 40 minutes of just like, God damn, like horses getting in your way. Because that's another weird thing, too. There's some people who are still kind of like riding on horses a little bit. And you're like, what the fuck? You know, like it's almost like a it's almost like two timelines together and molded together and a whole shitload of people have been dumped into that you know and that's where you're at right now Go Mitch ahead. will actually appreciate the horse riding he'll uh he'll give them <laughs> enough room nice so eventually you come upon this this bar the black rooster you, you see a silhouette of a rooster on there you you pull along uh the front right because there's like it's not like painted lines, but you can see cars are kind of painted at an angle, and there's like three spots there, and you're able to pull along there. Hello, folks. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts, or just media in general that deals with your favorite white wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded, one which wouldn't be drowned out by random posts and discussion so that your media could get the attention you want. Well, we have the answer for you in a Facebook group we run called Weight Wolf RPGs Gameplay and Media. The group is specifically ran with the sole intent of it being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. We are currently over 1,000 members strong, and we are continuing to rapidly grow with new media being shared every day. Stop on by. We hope to see you there. Hi, Level Games, the industry's first choice in taking your games to the next level. We are a podcast blog and new media network at highlevelgames.ca. We have blog posts about all of your favorite games going up five days a week and a podcasting network with actual plays and shows that discuss role-playing games with more rolling out all the time. We are on iTunes, Twitch, and YouTube. Find out more information at highlevelgames.ca, a site that certainly isn't controlled by a shadowy board of directors of otherworldly origin. That's highlevelgames.ca. Peace. Help. They're coming. <laughs>